Welcome to the Reform Movement Study Guide. To reform something means to change it, hopefully for the better. There were many reform movements in the early 1800s. One of the largest reform movements was the abolitionist movement. Abolitionists were people who were fighting against slavery. They believed the United States needed to end slavery if it was going to reach the high ideals that were set in the Declaration of Independence, like all men are created equal. Abolitionists believed that slavery was wrong. Some believed it because of political reasons, others believed it because of religious reasons. Henry Highland Garnett was one of the first African American abolitionists. He was an escaped slave. He was one of the first to speak often about abolition. And he was a great speaker who inspired African Americans to fight against slavery. He encouraged them not to run to safety in Canada, but to stay in the country and fight to end slavery. Many African Americans tried other ways to stop slavery. Some used the court systems by filing lawsuits. Of course, it took a white attorney to file for them as they were not allowed to speak in court. Anti-slavery newspapers were published telling the horror stories and putting a face on the people called slaves. And books were written encouraging slaves to resist slavery. During this time, the Second Great Awakening occurred. One of the leaders of the Second Great Awakening movement was Charles Grandison Finney. Finney encouraged his followers to purify their lives and give up sin. Just like the First Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening inspired religious revival. So many people were attending the meetings that they couldn't fit in the church and had to meet outside. They started to call these camp meetings. In addition to asking his followers to purify their lives and give up sin, Finney also asked them to take up the banner of reform, to speak out, to challenge the authority, just as in the First Great Awakening, and try to improve this country. He also argued that it was their duty to end slavery. So many, many of the people that were now members of the Protestant churches that were springing up all over the country were also members of the abolitionist movement. The American Colonization Society created a plan in 1817 to end slavery by starting a new colony for former American slaves in Africa. President Monroe even helped them establish the colony of Liberia. The plan called for Southerners to voluntarily free their slaves in exchange for some form of payment. Most African Americans were against this plan. They had been born and raised on plantations. They had never been to Africa. They didn't speak the language, they didn't know the people, and they didn't want to go to another country. The few that did choose to go were helped by one free African American named Paul Cuffey. His support of the plan actually led him to spend $4,000 to help resettle other free African Americans in the Siberian colony. Frederick Douglass was born a slave in Maryland. He taught himself to read. He escaped by train to Boston, Massachusetts. And then he began speaking at abolitionist meetings, telling people what it was like to be a slave. In 1838, while he was addressing an audience of abolitionists, he met a man named William Lloyd Garrison, who was also a staunch abolitionist. Garrison was so impressed with the way that Douglas was able to inspire the audiences and allow them to picture what it was like to be a slave through his words that he asked Douglas to go on tour with him, bringing his message to other abolitionist groups, and Douglas agreed. For many years he traveled around speaking to abolitionist groups until he got word that his former owners had petitioned for his return. In order to escape return to slavery, he had to flee to Britain. He stayed over in Britain for quite a while until his friends purchased him from his former owners. Once they purchased him, they gave him his freedom, and he was able to return to the United States, where he began publishing an abolitionist newspaper called the North Star. Later, he actually became an advisor to Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War. William Lloyd Garrison, as we just said, was an outspoken white abolitionist. Abolitionists were not just African Americans. There were many of the white citizens that were opposed to slavery. 
Garrison published an anti-slavery newsletter called The Liberator starting in 1831. Garrison himself was once attacked and dragged through the streets of Boston for his abolitionist ideas because there were some northerners that were not in favor of abolition. He also founded the New England Anti-Slavery Society. One of his members was a quite prominent preacher named Theodore Weld. He was also holding abolitionist meetings in the city of New York and he was very captivating charismatic speaker that was able to encourage many people to join the abolitionist cause including Harriet Beecher Stowe who ended up writing the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin Weld himself wrote many pamphlets for the society two of which were called the Bible against slavery which he wrote in 1837 and slavery as it is in 1839 there were many women involved in the abolitionist movement as well. Two sisters, Sarah and Angelina Grimke, were living on a slave plantation with their father, and they were so appalled by slavery that they moved to Philadelphia to help fight for abolition. Their speeches drew large crowds and some criticism. There were many men and women that felt that it was not a woman's place to speak publicly on any topic. Well, Sarah's response to this kind of criticism was, To me it is perfectly clear that whatsoever it is morally right for a man to do, it is morally right for a woman to do. Harriet Tubman was also a well-known abolitionist. She was an escaped slave. She escaped with the help of her local abolitionists on the Underground Railroad in 1850. The Underground Railroad was a network of abolitionists, both white and African American, that secretly helped runaway slaves reach their freedom. Harriet became a conductor on the Underground Railroad once she received her freedom. She made many, many trips back to the South to lead others to freedom. She ended up leading approximately 300 slaves, including her own parents, to freedom in St. Catherine, Canada. Remember, they were free when they hit the North, but because of the fugitive slave law that was passed, they could be captured and returned to the South. In Canada, they didn't have to worry about that. By 1852, there was a $40,000 bounty for Harriet Tubman's capture and return to her owners. During the Civil War, she became a nurse and a scout for the Union. And after the war, she worked to obtain women's rights. One of the things that the Underground Railroad used in order to fight against slavery were spiritual songs. The songs were started as a way to help lift the burden of their hard labor, and they were then used against their owners as codes to tell slaves what the escape routes were to freedom and when it was safe to run. Some of the examples of the coded spirituals were songs like Steal Away, wade in the water, follow the drinking gourd, and swing low sweet chariot. Quilts were also used as coded messages on the Underground Railroad. They let the slaves know if it was safe to approach one of the stations. The pictures on the quilts were coded messages to the escaping slaves, letting them know one, it's safe to come in, or two, run, it's not safe, they're looking for you. There were, unfortunately, some defenders of slavery that started to fight back against the abolitionists. Many Northerners, like merchants, depended on South for their livelihood. They considered the abolitionist movement a threat to their future and their business's future. Some feared that the freed African Americans would move North and take jobs from the whites. Pro-slavery groups argued that if slaves were well-fed and clothed, they would happily serve their masters. They wouldn't want to run away and non-slave owners in the South defended slavery because they hoped one day to have enough money to have slaves of their own and become rich plantation owners themselves. Southerners also saw the abolitionist movement as a threat to their very way of life and it scared them. And now you know a little bit about the abolitionist movement. <laughs>